I think we probably have some songs that are going to come up on the... There you go, Larry. Well, good morning, church. Uh, I hope uh, we're kind of small in number this morning, but I suppose maybe this coronavirus has uh, kept some home. We hope that that won't be uh, too big an issue here in Oklahoma, or especially for the church here. We need to come out and worship God and partake of the Lord's Supper and honor Him. And if we die doing that, well, we just go on to heaven. So we don't want to be frightful about things like that. Yeah, we're all going to go to heaven, but not right now. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what most of them do say. Yeah, right. right. Okay, we'll begin our song service. <clears throat> we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Amen. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Soon and very soon. Don't let that frighten you, okay? <clears throat> soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, no more crying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, no more crying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Amen. We'll have our scripture reading. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. I will be reading 2 Corinthians. Chapter 4, verse 16, through chapter 5, verse 4. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, that the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is not for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal way of glory. For we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For these things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly during to be clothed with our inhabitation, which is from heaven. 
If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Amen. We appreciate our young boys having the courage to stand up here before a congregation of people and read. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Kate. You did a great job. Yeah. Okay, we're going to sing this song as we get prepared for taking the Lord's Supper. And uh, let us uh, focus our minds on the Lord. Let's think about Jesus while we sing this song. Let's think about what He did and what He suffered for us as we sing this song together. Okay. <clears throat> When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to Thee, Garden of Gethsemane. Lord. There I walk amid the shades, while the lingering twilight fades, see his suffering friendless one weeping, praying there alone. When my love for man grows weak, when far stronger. Hill of Calvary, I go to the scenes of fear and woe. Behold his agony, suffered on the bitter tree. See. transpose the words into the actual physical happening of that day 2,000 years ago and realizing what really happened. Because on that day, we wonder, given the opportunity, would we stand in His stead? Because he stood in Steve's place. He stood in Valerie's place. He stood in every one of us's place at that point. Mm -hmm. How many of us would be willing to change that around and for us to stand in the place of our Lord and Savior as he did? I wonder what he was thinking 2,000 years ago on that morning. No, because he had his concerns. He became a man in thought for a little while. And yet he realized that I'm doing this for each and every person. Even those that don't, don't ever accept me, today I'm putting it on the cross that they may have it if they will only partake of it. We need to realize that He gave us something that day that we'll never get to duplicate. The only thing we can do 
is do this in remembrance of me. That's all he's asking. Is do it in remembrance of me. Obey the gospel. Partake of the things that he asks us to do. And we know what those are. And we all have family members that we wish we could reach out and wave that magic wand and get them to say, please, understand what God has asked us to do through His Son. We we're given the simplest instructions. They're really not hard. Sometimes it takes a little bit of prodding to get it done. But it's not hard. But I'll tell you what's hard. It's hard as walking into this building for funeral services for someone that never accepted Christ as their Savior. I can't imagine. I've heard Roy speak at funerals. Uh, I've heard a lot of other people here. And I realize how hard that has to be because Christ stood in the gap. He took the place of each of us <coughs> on that day 2,000 years ago. And if we would only, only come to our senses that God gave us, the aisle would be full this morning. For not only those that have never been baptized, but for those that have been but have fallen away. For those that are not here today, that we wish that they were here walking down that aisle, knowing that if the Lord is willing, we will have that one chance, maybe this afternoon, to even get blunt about it. So you need to get here. You need to become a Christian today. Jesus Christ stood in your place. The very least you could do was accept Him today. And don't be bashful about those that we know. It's far better to say what needs to be said than it is never to say it at all. You know, will you offer a prayer for the bread facer? Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you for this opportunity we have as your followers to partake of this bread, which to us represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who willingly gave his life on the cross that we would have an opportunity to be free of sin. Bless us for partaking, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that you put for us to all come together to worship you. Lord, we thank you most of all for your Son who gave his life on the cross for our sins. May we <clears throat> be with those that partake of this fruit of the vine that represented his blood on the cross. May we do so that in a way it is pleasing to him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to sing the last verse of the song that we sung a few minutes ago. Uh, the Lord Supper has been completed now. We we'll take this time to take up the contribution and an offering unto the Lord. So we can sing the place. Into life I turn again. heaven we're so thankful to you God for all the blessings that you've given us in life 
that Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, and through Him, God, we might have eternal life. We thank You, God, for all the blessings that we have, that everything that You've given us to use and carry on our lives. Pray, God, that this time we'd look in our heart, God, and give back to the church, God, that we might further the cause of Jesus Christ, that we might give freely, God, openly, happily, and that, God, we pray that it be used in a way and manner that be pleasing in your sight. Ask these blessings and give these thanks in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. When morning comes, brings a chuckle, it says, hi, Roy. <laughs> yeah, you had one down here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Britt. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the day. We're thankful that we can be here to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, to acknowledge that Jesus is our Lord, Jesus is our Master, Jesus is our King, and He's our elder brother. Father, we thank You for Him. We thank You for the cross of Calvary where He died for our sins. But Father, we also thank You that He reigns as King in our lives, that He reigns from heaven at Your right side. Father, we're so thankful that we can 
read about his life in your word. See all the many examples of living that he has given to us. That we can imitate him in the ways that he talked. The ways that he behaved. The ways he treated people. And Father, help us to do the same. Father, we're thankful that we can live in a country that allows us the freedom to worship. And Father, we think about so many around the world who don't have such luxuries and don't have the freedoms and all the various conveniences that go along with freedom. Father, we pray that you be with those folks, be with our brethren around the world who under extreme pressures and laws and governing authorities, they have to worship in private or face death. Father, we pray that you be with them and be with, with their families at this time. And Father, be with our country as we go through a, a crisis that I guess we haven't been through before. But Father, we pray that you'll be with those who are working toward a cure for this ailment. Pray, Father, that there would be a cure. And we pray, Father, that in your time that you will eliminate such things from hurting not only the people of this country, but people around the world. And Father, we're thankful for the, the land that we do live in, the land that not only promotes freedoms, but secures them. We pray, Father, that these freedoms will stand for a long time for our children, for their children, and for the children's children. Father, they too can grow up in a land where an emphasis on religion is placed, respect for one another is encouraged, and kindness is shown. Pray, Father, that this will be done in our land now, but it can only be done through us. And we pray, Father, that we'll be the leading lights, the examples to everyone around us to show love, concern, and kindness to everyone, to everyone in our community and to those whom we, we, whom we meet. Father, we thank you for the church that Jesus died for. We thank you for being a part of this body that we can share with one another, that we can fellowship with one another, and Father, that we can worship together as brethren in Christ. Father, we thank you for all the blessings in Jesus Christ, especially the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but this morning has been rather uh, uplifting for me. Uh, we've had some good thoughts from Ken, good song leading, good songs that we've been singing. And the men that led the table put us in the right frame of mind. And uh, of course, the scripture reading. I, uh, Caden did a great job in reading Amen. the scripture. Amen. I'll tell you, that voice of his, it sounds like one of them TV preachers already with that voice that he's got. And uh, maybe one day he will be, who knows? But uh, we, uh, we're thankful that he did that and did it in such a, a, a great way of reading that scripture. We have been in a series of lessons concerning idolatry. And we have looked at several of the things that culture kind of throws at us. And I mean by that, that culture expects uh, us to act in a certain way. And uh, today we'll be talking about the idol of looks. The idol of looks. We are inundated with how we're supposed to look. Uh, if you look at the grocery line that you stand in and you look at the magazines on the rack, you're going to find all those magazines are dealing with beauty, with how you can improve your own beauty, how you can improve your physique, how you can get in better shape, all of that. And so we bow down at the idol or the God of looks in so many different ways. And so 
I was thinking about that preparing this lesson, thinking about how this coronavirus has come about and has kind of driven our economy down into the dumpers. And uh, we went from here to here in a relatively short time. And so that made me think about my own physical appearance as it relates to the economy. And so I find that my hair is in recession. <laughs> and I find that my stomach is in inflation. <laughs> oh, sure, you laugh at that one. Right. <laughs> and, and the whole thing has put me in the depression. So uh, that's like the economy. So I have that economic body that we can be thankful for. But our culture, again, is inundated with, with things about looks and about beauty and about uh, all of those uh, commercials on television about how you can look younger and how you can uh, extend your looks well into your older years as we age. And so it reminds me of a, a story of the husband. Uh, he asked his wife, he said, how can you be so pretty and so dumb? And she said, well, God made me pretty so that you would love me. And God made me dumb so that I would love you. So, <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that. And the reason, and the reason we bow down, the reason we worship the God of looks is because the promise that the idol makes for us. It tells us that looking good is so much better than being good. So much better than being good. And so I want to call your attention to this. Fernando's Hideaway. Oops. I don't know if you'll remember this. This is Saturday Night Live some years ago. And uh, we're having technical difficulties. I don't remember it being a silent movie. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, brother? So the subject is the Holy Roman Empire. It wasn't really holy, and it wasn't really an empire. Talk amongst yourselves while we wait for this. <laughs> so you know, my friends, I don't know who you are. Coming, I mean, I don't know today, I was one of the biggest names in baseball. It's got 12 brothers, and if I come to live myself, one of them? You want to take it off? Isn't he my wish? He's still outspoken right now. Bring up the principal owner of the New York Yankees. We'll find out exactly what that means. It's a whole great time now, George. I don't want to go to the other way. George, first of all, I got to tell you something from the bottom of my arm. Oh, impressive. You are so fabulous. You look marvelous. Thank you very much. It's fabulous. You know, for me, I don't want to look for them to feel good. Isn't that the case? There it is, Fernando. He was doing a skit uh, about Fernando Lamas, favorite Spanish actor. And uh, of course, that's Billy Crystal. And he's, and he's uh, giving it straight, really, because he felt that's the way Fernando Lamas acted, which was he was all concerned about his looks. And when he would appear on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, this guy had you know beautiful white hair, this gorgeous if a guy can say that, a gorgeous gentleman, right? This just good looking guy, very tan, and he's wearing this uh, white sport coat and wearing the white pants and he's got those sandals on his feet and he's just looking all really good. And, and he talked like that. He said, uh, you know, oh, I, you look really good tonight, Johnny, he would say. And uh, I can't do it as good as Billy, but, uh, but the whole point was is that he says, you look marvelous, you look marvelous. It's better to look good than to feel good. 
And that is a sentiment, I believe, that is part of many people's thinking in this lifetime. It's better to look good than to feel good. In fact, when we think about that particular aspect concerning our culture, did you know that the thinner you are, the more likely you're going to get a job over one who's a little bit larger, right? So the appearance of the individual plays an important role in our culture and in our society. And of course, when you're looking at models of women, they become objects. But if you look at those typical uh, women, those models, you're going to find that the in-fit model, the thinner model, is going to get more attention than the larger model. And uh, in fact, when you think about the idea of Old Navy, Old Navy got in trouble so many years ago. And I'll tell you how it affected the economics of being large. What they were doing was they were selling the same product, but they were selling the larger products at a higher price. And so we come into this Good Morning America newscast. Change it, brother. Accusations of sexism and sizeism against one of the country's top retailers. All day is under fire for charging more for plus size women's clothing, not doing the same thing for men. ABC's Paula Ferris got that story. This morning, furious customers demanding Old Navy implement a new policy when it comes to some of its plus size clothing for women. Clothing the retail giant charges more for than regular sizes. Really pretty frustrating to me. Renee Posey is the woman behind the Change.org petition that now has 30,000 signatures and counting. She says she found a price markup on some of Old Navy's plus size items for women online. Though its men's line costs the same across the board. I felt that it was sexist and I felt that it was sizes. We looked at the site ourselves and found not only a separate tab for women's plus items, but different prices, like these rock star super skinny jeans, normally $35 for regular, $45 for plus size. Old Navy telling ABC News overnight that its plus size clothes cost more because we invest more in them, saying the line is specifically designed and manufactured to fit and flatter our valued customers. We visited an Old Navy store in the middle of New York's Herald Square and searched, but you won't find a price discrepancy here in the store because all the plus sizes are sold online. But this morning, Posey said she's working with Old Navy to change that, discussing, among other things, how to bring plus sizes to stores. We have seen uh, instances where companies have not included plus sizes in their lines. Take uh, our company, for example, has recently added larger sizes to its clothing offerings after a backlash. Customers go to war with their favorite stores and sometimes winning. For Good Morning America, Paula Ferris, ABC News, New York. And so when we think about the idea of looks and the idol of looks, we can see how it impacts everything in our lives, in our culture. But as you think about the idol of looks, there was a point in time in 2008 when the Olympics were held in Beijing, China. And they went out of their way to put on this wonderful, extravagant affair never seen before in Olympic history. And, uh, and so at the beginning of the Olympics, they, they sent out this nine-year-old girl, I don't know if you remember this, but she sang and she was singing uh, songs about the motherland and it had people crying and uh, just a beautiful, beautiful singing voice. The problem was it wasn't her. They said how actually the voice came from a seven-year-old girl and, uh, and the reason they decided to do that was because the nine-year-old girl didn't fit the image. She was a rather large girl. And so they wanted the smaller, thinner girl to be on stage while she lip synced the whole song. And so we can see how looks impact so many lives. In fact, when you think about uh, our teenage community, uh, the years uh, between 11 and 17, we find that we have 
17 million who are dealing with eating disorders, primarily anorexia. Why? Well, again, you stand in that grocery market line, and if you're a young girl, and you look at the pictures of those women who are thin, and they're pretty, and those pictures are doctored up, you know, photoshopped, as they say, computer digitized, and all that. And so they're made to look even better than they are. And so what we find is this depression among young women is setting in at those young ages, between 11 and 17, because the truth of the matter is they cannot attain to the level of beauty in those pictures. And the second point is that they can't sustain the beauty of the people in those pictures. You know why? Because we get older. We get older. And our looks change. And so there is this thing about growing old gracefully. And we accept it. And it reminds me of a story that Cindy Crawford did, supermodel Cindy Crawford. And she was saying, did you know that I have the best makeup people in the business? And did you know that I have the best photographers in the business? And the best computer people in the business that can alter my looks and appearances on the computer for those pictures? She said, even Cindy Crawford doesn't look like Cindy Crawford. And that's, how, that's so very true. So very true. And so the culture says, this is what you should look like. But the reality is far from that. And we need to realize that many have died because of the idol of looks, have committed suicide over such things as looks, that how many young girls have killed themselves because they have not attained to the level of supermodel? And how many people have gone into alcoholism and drugs, addiction? All of that plays a part with the idol of looks. Abraham Lincoln once said that God loves the average looking the most because he made so many of them. And that is true. You know, there's always the exception, right? There's an exception to every rule. All of us, I suppose, are average looking. But there's always going to be somebody who's extraordinary, great looking. And, uh, you know, you, I was watching a movie last night. Uh, uh, well, Brad Pitt was in it. So you think about, here's that Brad Pitt. And I, I know, I kind of look like him, but... <laughs> But you look at that guy and you say, man, that's a good looking guy right there. Or a, a George Clooney, or you know, even watching some older movies with Cary Grant, right? And so you have these people who are blessed with these looks, but the rest of us, God blessed us with average looks. And we need to understand that. And, and as we look at the Bible, we're gonna get to that in just a second, but as we consider the looks, there are deceptions that come along with the idol of looks. Looks keep mortality at bay. And what does that mean? It means we just read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, or Caden read for us, but there the Bible was telling us, he says, the outward man is perishing. It's dying. And in fact, did you notice that the moment you were brought into this world, the moment you came out of your mother, you began to die. Amen. Began to die. We began to deteriorate. And so Paul's bringing that out. He's saying, listen, he goes, I'm an example of this. And as I walk along and all these journeys, I'm realizing my outward man is perishing. I can't do the things that I once used to do. He says, but thankfully, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And it's the inward man that counts. 
The outward man, we can fuss and fight and spend all our time caring about the outward man that we forget about the inward man or woman. Because it's the inward being that God specifically says he desires, he loves the inward man, not the outward. And yet we have a culture that places the premium on the outward. So the outward man is dying. We need to understand that. Take it to heart. Our bodies are simply walking posters for the reality of death. That's what this is about. And I brought this to the attention of the elders this morning, that I am experiencing pain I haven't experienced in a long time. I either got gallstones or kidney stones. I don't know what's going on, but I got them. And, uh, and it's all part of getting older. And I have to put up with those things just like you do. And, uh, and so uh, sleep was not a good thing last night, but I am here this morning and, um, and I'm thankful for it, but I'm hoping that this pain will go away. You know, when my mother was visiting, <laughs> we were sitting down watching the television and she came across that commercial, you've probably seen the commercial, where uh, the, I think it's Plexiderm, nice. is you, you just take this one little dab of cream and you put it under your eyes and the bags under your eyes, they disappear and you look like you're 20 years old, right? She says, oh, I want to get that. She goes, where can I get that? I said, you could probably get it at Amazon. So she says, well, how do you do that? I said, I'll order it for you. So I got her. I ordered that stuff for her. A couple days later, it came in the mail, and uh, she was excited to get it. And so she went to the bathroom, and she, she put that stuff on her face, and she came out. And she said, do I look any younger? And I said, you got to wait a few minutes, Mom. I, you gotta, I think it's 10 minutes, you know? So she sat down, and we were drinking a coffee, and she says, OK, how about now? Do I look any younger? And I said, well, it, it does work. I said, you're 87, right? She says, yeah. I said, well, you look like you're 86 in 10 months. <laughs> she didn't like that too much. but. But the truth is, it did work. So if you're interested in getting it, I will sell the product here from the pulpit that it does, it does do a good job. It does work. And, and she was happy with it, and that's the main thing. And, uh, and so, uh, but. You forgot it only works up to four hours. Yeah, that's right. So you got to keep applying it. So that's the first misconception and deception that mortality is held at bay because of the God of looks. And of course, the second deception here is looks are the same as beauty. And we've been talking about that because the Lord tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, do not consider his appearance or his height. Well, that's the way human beings look at people. We consider their appearance. We consider their height. The taller person is going to get more attention than the shorter person. The better looking person is going to get more attention than the uglier person. The thinner person, more attention than the, the larger person. I say that. I was going to say fatter, but larger person. He says, for I have rejected him. Notice that. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. So while everyone is up there, oh, this guy is wonderful. Just look at him. God said, no, he's not. He says, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. At the heart. You could be the best looking person in the world and have the ugliest heart and you are an ugly person no matter how good looking one might be. 1 Peter chapter 3 says don't be concerned with outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry or clothes instead clothe yourself with the beauty that comes from within. 
the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy woman of old made themselves beautiful. And while that's directly addressing the women, my male brothers, you have to understand that also applies to us in principle. Don't be concerned about the outward appearance. I remember when I was younger and I was going to the gym an awful lot, you know, lifting them weights and all of that stuff. And uh, I remember uh, looking at some of the bodybuilders that were in the gym, and there they were, <laughs> looking in the mirror. Just look at, just look at me. Look at you know, and and they, and they they do that for hours, just stand in the mirror, just consumed with themselves. And I thought, this is the weirdest thing. <laughs> and lifting weights no longer became a thing to me. It was like, I, I, I can get in better shape someplace else because that <laughs> doesn't cut it for me. But the point is, God is not saying, don't be concerned with your looks. You can be concerned with your looks. And certainly we ought to be concerned with our hygiene as this coronavirus is showing us. And so we do need to understand it's important to wash our hands, to have the proper hygiene as we come into contact with people. And so the next thing that we need to understand is to be greatly concerned with our inner beauty. Now, I'm reminded of the story of Samson. You remember Samson. The longer his hair, the stronger he was. He cut his hair and he couldn't do a thing, right? But with Samson, what we learned was he liked the appearance of women. He liked the outward appearance. And I happen to think that he kind of liked his outward appearance too. Right? He was focused upon his physicality and the physicality of others. But what happened in the end, his eyes were plucked out because of his loss of focus. His eyes were plucked out, and guess what happened? He began to rightfully focus upon things that mattered, God being one of them. And because he started focusing on the inward, because he could no longer see the outward, he became a better person for it. And the same thing with us. It's the inner beauty. It's the inside that counts so much. And as we think about the physicality of the outside, your identity is not based on your physicality. You remember that song from the 70s with Carly Simon? You're so vain. You probably think this song is about you, right? <laughs> Interesting lyrics, but that's true. And she was singing to a group of people at that time that she ran with and, and how vain these people were. And you just think about how those people who can't go by a mirror without looking in the mirror at themselves. Perhaps we're all guilty of that. But again, we look back to what God said. He says, I desire the inward beauty. And when the inward man is growing, as Paul would say, being renewed day by day, that's what he's saying. He's saying, your heart is growing stronger and greater for God day by day. That's what matters. Nothing else matters. In the final analysis, we're all going to die. And that's the point. There's a gravestone for uh, Mel Blank. Remember Mel Blank was the voice of Bugs Bunny and all those different voices. And, uh, and I guess on, on his tombstone it says, but -da -ba -da -ba -da. that's all, folks. Right? <laughs> Uh, I hate to break it to Mel, but I think he knows now that's not all. It's not all. There's life after death. And there's a place that we're going to go to. And it's one of two places. And it's based upon what we do in this lifetime now. There is a place called hell. Jesus talks about hell. In fact, Jesus talks more about hell than he does about love. But of course, he also talks about heaven. But concerning hell, it's a place of fire. They call it hell fire. And it's reserved for people 
who spent so much time consumed with self, consumed with self, consumed with the idol of looks, bowing down to a God that God said is useless. Because in the final analysis, what will looks bring you? We all go to the same place. And so what's reserved, therefore, is how our heart was during this lifetime. Was it a heart for God and for others? Or was it a heart for self as we bow down to the God of looks? And so we got to decide, therefore, since there is a hell. And I know, uh, I, you know, I, I was thinking about that the other day. I haven't had a lesson on hell since I've been here. And uh, I think I'll do that. I think we need to know more about hell because we need to keep our lives in perspective. We need to keep heaven before us. And we also need to know about the punishment that awaits those who reject the Lord's word. And so we got to decide to make God look good. That's the whole point of our being. Right? That's what, that's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. He says, what did he say? What did he say? Say it. You don't remember? There you go, brother. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. That's what it comes down to. God boiled it all down. He said, this, this is the most important thing for you in your life. Practice it. And so, when you think about the idea of practicing inner beauty, think about Romans chapter 12, where Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He's saying, just like he said elsewhere in the gospel accounts, where he said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Well, here he's saying, you offer up your body as a living sacrifice. You give your whole being to God as you go through life. He says, that's your reasonable, logikos. That's your logical service to God. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind, the inward man, the mind, the same thing, the same person. It's that spirit within. And he says, you renew your mind day by day, becoming more spiritual. That's what he's calling us to do. And so I think it was Oscar Wilde that said, if you light up from within, any old face will do. It's so true. Light up within. And that's what God wants us to do. He says, I want you to light up from within. And then he says, when you do that, the whole world will know Jesus lives in you. And that's what we're here to do. We're not here to live for ourselves. We're here to live for him. And we're there. We're here to show that he exists by what we do in this lifetime for him. And so we put forth Jesus Christ in all things. Whether it be little things or big things. Whether it's the things we say or the things we do. But when we come into contact with people, they have to see Jesus living within each of us. And that's a responsibility given to each of us. And so God desires that inner beauty. And the inner beauty that you can have this morning begins with a promise that Jesus made. He says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Salvation is a beautiful word because it has beautiful meaning to it. It's the opposite of what he goes on to say. He says, he that does not believe is condemned, is damned. But he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. 
Our brother Ken was talking about that very thing in the communion thought this morning. Talking about how it's something that we should say. Don't let, don't let things go unsaid. This life is short. And we don't know if we have tomorrow. And we don't know if our loved ones have tomorrow. So the things that need to be said need to be said today. And Christ is saying, if you have not put Jesus Christ on in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, you're not in Christ. And you need to be told that. Because the words of Jesus are very simple. He, anybody that believes and is baptized will be saved. A promise and a fact. And so we need to teach that to others. We need to teach the words of Jesus because they are forever. His word endures forever. But if you desire to have the confidence of life in Christ, be assured of your salvation and to know that you have the beauty that Jesus desires of you, you can do that this morning. If by faith you want to put Jesus Christ on in baptism this morning, or if you've done that, but you've walked away from the Lord and you've gotten ugly inside, Jesus says, you can become beautiful once again inside. All you need to do is repent. Repent of your sins and return. If that sounds good to you this morning, why don't you come forward as together we stand and say. once again as your children to come before you that we might honor you in spirit and in truth, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for these great lessons that we have been presented to this day. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we might be a doer of the word rather than just only a hearer of the word because, Heavenly Father, we know that your word is to meant to move each and every one of our lives, that we might be more closer to you, Heavenly Father, that we might love to love one another, Heavenly Father, and that the world might know us as your disciples by the way 
and the love we have one for another. We are so grateful, Heavenly Father, for your word. We're grateful, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ, your Son, who willingly came and gave his life that we might have this opportunity to be your children, that we might have this opportunity to have forgiveness, Heavenly Father, of our sins and be with you forevermore after we live this life. For we know, Heavenly Father, that we are only pilgrims going through this land, that this earth is not our home, but our home is being prepared, or have been prepared through your Son, Jesus Christ. Now, Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for this country, pray for the world, that they might wake up and realize that it is you who we need to honor, that no matter what happens, Heavenly Father, that we should focus on you and not so much upon the things of this world. Now, Heavenly Father, as we are about to be dismissed, we pray that you would go with each and every one of us, keep us safe until we meet again. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. amen.